My topic is reconstructing curricula from student notes, explorations into the collections of Johann Mattenberg and uh, Johann Gerhard. Um, <clears throat> the research library of Gotha is the fourth largest historical library in the Federal Republic of Germany. Its origins can be traced back to the year 1647 when Duke Ernest of Saxe Gotha founded a court library at the newly erected uh, Friedenstein Palace, palace just outside the town walls of Gotha. Here's a, a cover plate from the 17th century showing the palace above and the town of Gotha below. Um, as was mentioned in the course of the cataloging of, of early modern European manuscripts at the library in the past 15 years, documents related to educational history in the 16th and 17th centuries have been identified. Uh, among the vast and diverse, diverse material are notes from over 150 academic lectures. The majority was held um, at various German universities, but some lectures have their origins in France and Italy. Most are either part of the extraordinary collections in Gotha related to the Reformation, or part of the literary estate and library of the renowned Lutheran theologian, Johann Gerhard, we just heard about, and his son, Johann Ernst Gerhard. Um, here's a portrait of Johann Gerhard. The so-called Bibliotheca Gerhardina, one of the most extensive scholarly libraries of the 17th, of 17th century Germany, not only contains notes from the academic years of the Gerhards, but also numerous volumes from students that had lived long before them, testifying to the general interest of early modern scholars in collecting such manuscripts for their personal libraries. Descriptions of these notes and documents can be found in catalogs that were recently published by the um, Research Library of Gotha. <clears throat> Here are the two titles. The first one is on the Reformation manuscripts and the second one on the literary states of the Gerhards. The descriptions are also available in the online Calliope Union Catalog, the central online catalog for literary states, autograph writings, and archives of publishing houses in Germany. Here I'm showing you an, um, an entry of one of the um, lectures that was cataloged. Here was a lecture from Justinian's Institutiones. Um, here's a shelf mark, card A or A626. <clears throat> it was held by the professor Kasper Alteneich um, at the Faculty of Law at the University of Wittenberg. And here's other information on the lecture. It was started on April 24th, 1570 and ended in Jan on January 22nd, 1571. And here below you can see that as part of the literary estate of the Gerhards. Several volumes of student notes in the Gotha collection are from Gerhard's father-in-law, Johann Mattenberg. It is one of the most, and here too you can see um, that it was written, this, these lectures from Johann Gerhard in his entry in Calliope. Um, his collection is the most extensive surviving collection documenting the university studies of a single 16th century student in Germany. It encompasses five folio and six quarto volumes penned by Mattenberg. That's a total of approximately 4,000 leaves. The collection contains notes from more than 50 lectures. Born in 1550 in Hanover, Münden, Johann Mattenberg studied in Marburg, Wittenberg, Jena, and Padua from 1568 to 1579. On August 31st, 1579, he obtained his doctorate at the French University of Valence and later became the personal physician of King Henry IV of France. He served as physician at several courts and towns before settling in Gotha in 1586. There he died in 1631. That all the <clears throat> all 11 volumes are part of one collection written by Mattenberg was a discovery made just uh, 10 years ago. The distinct handwriting 
made it clear that they all stem from one person. And fortunately, Mattenberg wrote his name as owner of one of the manuscripts. Here's an example of his handwriting. Knowing his name made it possible to find out where and when this little known scholar had studied using matriculation books and bibliographical information in a sermon held at his funeral. This information opens new possibilities for contextualizing and analyzing the material. For example, it is now apparent that Muttenberg did not hear some of the words preserved in his collection since they were spoken well before his time, including sayings from Martin Luther and protocols of Wittenberg debates held in the 1540s and 50s. Instead, he must have gained access to transcripts of these and then had them copied for his own learning interests. In my paper, I would like to focus on the insights this is, that this extraordinary collection offers into the real life curricula of early modern Protestant universities in the German Empire. University and faculty statutes and other normative documents provide valuable guidelines, but they also have the limitations. Lecture catalogs list courses that were offered, but they do not reveal which students took which ones and which sequence. Student notes, however, document what the students actually experienced. Due to the extensiveness of this collection, Mattenberg's studies can be re reconstructed relatively thoroughly this can then serve as a touchstone for the solidity of some questionable assumptions common today regarding university studies half a millennium ago. At the start, it's important to note that the first three universities that Mattenberg studied at, Marburg, Wittenberg, and Jena, were Protestant German universities. The curriculum at the University of Wittenberg had been significantly reformed under the aegis of Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon in the 1520s. The reforms had a great impact on the other universities that became Protestant. Two of the main goals were to accommodate the new educational demands of the humanistic movement and to mold the university into a center of learning for future clergy. Due to the new emphasis placed on the word in the wake of the, of the Reformation, Pastors were expected to acquire philological and rhetorical skills, as well as a solid knowledge of philosophy and theology, in order to convey central principles of Lutheran theology in a well composed sermon. To satisfy the urgent demand for pastors, the years of study had to be preferably short. To this end, barriers between the faculties of arts and theology were lifted. An academic degree was not necessary to gain access to lecture, lectures in the higher faculties of medicine, law, and theology, or to be invested with a church office. These changes that are not so well known today can be clearly illustrated by reconstructing Mattenberg's studies. Surprisingly, the earliest surviving notes from Mattenberg's university studies do not pertain to the trivium or quadrivium but rather they are from lectures on law. Perhaps Mattenberg originally intended on focusing his studies on law. In 1568, he attended a general introduction to Roman law, and in the following year, a lecture on feudal law. Between 1570 and 72, he heard two lectures by Caspar Altenreich on the Institutiones. We saw the entry in Calliope on one of those lectures. At the same time, he attended lectures offered by the faculties of philosophy and theology in Wittenberg. These include rhetoric and philosophical lectures on Cicero's Oratio Pro Ligario, Melius de Amicitia, and Epistolae Familiares. Also a series of translation and stylistic exercises, lectures by Christoph Petzl on dialectic in 1569 and 70, and by Wolfgang Krell, on ethics from 1571 to 1573. In the area of mathematics and natural sciences, Mattenberg attended a lecture on Melanchthon's Liber de Anima and on arithmetic in 1570 and lectures on astronomy, geometry, and the theory of planets in 73. Theology also formed an integral part of the general studies in Wittenberg. In 1569 and 70, Mattenberg attended a lecture on the Gospel of John and later a lecture on the main articles of Christian faith. 
Munmeg acquired further knowledge of theology in a lecture on Melanchthon's Examen Ordinandorum, begun in 1570. In 1771, he deepened his knowledge on the freedom of the will in a lecture based on Melanchthon's Lotzi Communis Theologici. A collection with numerous Wittenberg debates and theses on theological questions, partly from his own time and partly from the time of Luther and Melanchthon, also testify to, to uh, Mattenberg's study of theology. The earliest medical notes are from a lecture held on Galen in 1572. And from 1574 on, only medical notes can be found in Mattenberg's collection. <clears throat> This shift from a diversified, diversified studies encompassing courses from all four faculties to an absolute focus on medicine perhaps correlates to a change in Mattenberg's academic status. I haven't been able to find out when and where he obtained his master's degree. Um, a medical book, book bound for his personal library in 1575 is embossed with the initials IMM. This stands either for Johannes Mattenbergius Magister or Johannes Mattenbergius Mudensis, uh, the latter referring to Münden, the place of his birth. Um, could be the title here. Reconstructing the lectures that Mattenberg is known to have attended clearly reveals that the curricula at the Protestant universities in central Germany were broadly diversified and could be easily individualized according to one's own academic interests without having to obtain a master's degree. Thus, this example dispels widespread misconceptions in research literature claiming that students at Protestant universities first had access to courses offered by the higher faculties after completing a master's degree. These misconceptions have arisen due in part to the tendency to indiscriminately project notions of the well-known medieval university model of Paris, in which students truly had been required to complete studies in the trivium and quadrivium before attending lectures at a higher faculty to academic institutions in different areas of Europe centuries later. A brief comparison of the lecture notes that have survived from the studies of Mattenberg's son-in-law, Johann Gerhard, confirm these findings. Gerhard studied in Wittenberg, Jena, and Marburg from 1599 to <clears throat> 1605. Notes from 15 lectures he attended can be found in the, his literary state in Gotha. They reveal that he took courses offered by the faculties of philosophy, medicine, and theology during his three years at the University of Wittenberg. And hence that, like Mattenberg, his early years of study were broadly diversified. Autobiographical sources state that Gerhard originally concentrated his studies on medicine. Collections of medical prescriptions among his student notes buttress this, but this focus is otherwise not clearly mirrored in the surviving notes. This observation reminds us that in most cases, notes surviving today from a single student of the early modern period is far from complete. Thus, uh, even Mattenberg's collection is far from, far from complete. Um, it's just a, a fraction. Thus, it is always important to keep in mind that the survival of student notes is often very random. In the summer of 1603, Gerhard transferred to the University of Jena. There he obtained his master's degree on August 2nd, 1603. At this point, all surviving lectures, be it only three from Gerhard's year at the University of Marburg, pertain to one subject, namely theology. This corresponds to Muttenberg's specialization after achieving his degree. On November 13, 1603, Gerhard was granted his doctorate in theology in Jena. <clears throat> Intermingled in the volumes containing notes from his studies are also manuscripts of lectures and debates that he held parallel to his studies. Interestingly, the earliest are from 1602. This means a year before. Gerhard, uh, Gerhard attain, obtained his master's degree, he was offering private lectures. They were on logic and rhetoric. This observation stands in contradiction to the common understanding of the master's degree as a prerequisite for teaching at a university. After receiving his degree in Jena, Gerhard became an authorized assistant of the Faculty of Philosophy. 
However, he did not just offer lectures and debates on metaphysics and other areas of philosophy, but also on theology, specifically the basic course on the Augsburg Confession. During the end of my paper, I would like to touch upon one last question, namely, how was it possible for so many newcomers at the German universities in the 16th century to immediately delve into a, such a wide array of disciplines without first concentrating solely on the fundamentals represented by the liberal arts? It's because numerous well-known, well-endowed Latin schools in the German empire offered a curriculum that overlapped with the basic curriculum of universities. This can be observed in many of the teaching schedules that have survived, and also in the notebooks preserved from Gerhard's school in Quedlinburg. <clears throat> Here's an example of one page, and it's from his handwriting from these school notebooks. These rank among the most comprehensive school notes from a single German pupil in the 16th century that exists today. They reveal that Gerhard not only had full command of the Latin language, before entering the university, but that he had also gained an understanding of Greek and Hebrew in the course of his schooling. In Quedlinburg, he was interested in, he was instructed in rhetoric, dialectic, poetry, letter writing, and works from Cicero, Virgil, and other classical authors, and also in biblical exegesis and systematic uh, theology. The theological education during the school days included the practice of summarizing sermons held in the local church. Among the notes is also a handwritten copy of a Latin book on the customs of the Turks that Gerhard had made when he was 13 years old. Perhaps such cultural studies were also part of the school curriculum. All this shows that the educational system in 16th and 17th century Germany was by no means so as rigidly structured as it is today. To conclude, the surviving notes written by Johann Mattenberg and Johann Gerhard convey impressions of studies at Protestant German universities in the 16th and 17th centuries that contradict some notions that are still very common in current literature on university history. They dispel, for example, the misconceptions that all university studies began exclusively with the trivium and quadrivium, and that a master's degree was not, was a prereq, uh, the misconception that a master's degree was a prerequisite for attending lectures in the higher faculties. Conversely, they show that many students had been well instructed in the trivium, the humanities, and theology before entering the university, that the university curriculum was very flexible and diversified, that it was possible to attend courses offered by the higher faculties without first achieving a master's degree, and that some students had a clear-cut specialization first after achieving a master's degree. Other student notes and complementary sources that I've examined confirm these findings. It would be interesting to know if these are truly particular to early modern Protestant universities, or if some of these surprising findings also hold true for Catholic universities in and beyond the German Empire. This would, however, require a large-scale comparison of well-preserved student notes throughout Europe. But maybe some of you can help me to answer this question. Thanks for giving me your attention. Well, this is a, a very interesting field and uh, area where we entered uh, the day to uh, day life of students, their curriculum. And uh, well, the very important question, how should we see the shifts in curricula. They did not always uh, uh, were purely institutional or formal, but they were also uh, well, visible, tangible in uh, students' lives and in uh, documents which are uh, autobiographical. So this is uh, uh, an interesting, uh, well, uh, nerve in this network of uh, knowledge. Thank you very much, Daniel. And I can imagine that uh, a lot of questions will come up after hearing this uh, exposition, uh, this uh, expose. Nobody so far, as, I, as far as I can see anyway. I don't see any 
Because there is and, on. Ah, there is. On Smith, please, on. Yes. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you very much. I will start my video too, maybe. Uh, thank you for, for this lecture. I was wondering by the number of lecture notes on medicine, because in Leuven, uh, we only have very few lecture notes on medicine. As far as I am aware of, uh, there are no lecture notes for medicine in the 15th and the 16th century. I only know one of the 17th century and seven or eight for the 18th century. So you are were mentioning a lot of lecture notes for the Faculty of Medicine. So I was wondering if the situation is completely different in Germany. Yeah. Um, yeah, I left out um, a lot about the medical lectures that he held. I didn't have enough time to um, include that into my speech, but um, over half the collection um, from Mattenberg's uh, studies are from his uh, lectures he heard in Padua. Um, mm. There's a, yeah, a, quite a few of those. And um, let me think about the other um, notes that we have on lectures in Germany. Not many are on, on, on medicine. Uh, as you said, um, this is maybe an exception, um, making them even more valuable than they yeah, in this context, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, for informing me about that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions, please? Feel free. I have a question, if I may, uh, Jan. Okay. Um, I, I found it very interesting that you mentioned uh, this competition between the Latin schools and the lower uh, faculties. And I was wondering, was this competition seen as, as something, uh, yeah, as, as a kind of impediment or was it applauded or was there indifference about this situation? So that, um, do you know anything about this? Um. <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's always considered a, a real competition um, between the schools and the universities to some degree, of course, because, um, yeah, they even have um, some sources, I know in the 16th century, that even the, the Latin school in Gotha was uh, very prominent. And um, uh, there was some discussion in the 16th century of, uh, it was built up quite a bit and people to save, families to save money on schooling, they had their sons sent to the, the Latin school to get well educated before they sent to the university because the university costs more. Um, so even, yeah, it's, it's clear in the minds of the people at the time that um, the, some of the more prominent Latin schools had the, an equivalent, often an equivalent of, of, of teaching to that of the universities. And um, yeah, that's the explanation that I have or, um, that there is for why um, students could at the universities could start out um, in such many, in such different uh, disciplines. Um, but at the universities, for example, the University of Vienna um, is one example. We have a pedagogium; it's called for you can also send your like, people could send their sons there early, and they could get in this pedagogium, this like a school which is like a, a associated with the university. They can learn the um, the basics there. So, yeah, but that's a common phenomenon in, in Germany. Uh, there, like Magdeburg too was one of the most prominent Latin schools in um, 16th century Germany and central Germany. That's, yeah, a lot of it's almost the equivalent of a university or, um, at the end, even, yeah, I must think of Strasbourg. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, please. Thanks so much. Yes, I love this problem of the much richer view we have than regulations offer. And I wonder if you find the regulations at all responding to what you describe as people taking courses out of, you know, uh, their patterns. Do you see that the regulations are being reissued because they're, they're trying to get people to follow them? Or um, is anybody, you know, basically complained about, a master being complained about, or students for mis misfollowing the guidelines? Um, no, it's, I don't think that 
the, the way the, the students are studying, the way I depicted it, I think that's how um, the studies were um, reformed in the Wittenberg, uh, uh, at Wittenberg, that that's what the professors wanted. Um, like I said, that was the only way for, for young men to um, be educated as pastors within, most of them studied for just two or three years at a university in the 16th century. Um, you can't wait uh, to get a master's degree. It takes a couple of years. That's, that doesn't work, the system. They have to so be able no, to do it. Yeah, there's no they, antagonism they between the professors and the administration. Oh. That's why there's no nowadays there'd be a, yeah there'd be an antagonism yeah. between the administration maybe and the professors yeah. but here there is no administration is that right basically uh, there's some administration but they're they're studying the way that uh, yeah. the professors wanted to it is it's much open it's just a totally different system than today and that's that's the yeah. problem which you know, it's never been seen or it's only can be seen from student notes mm -hmm. thank you because you won't find yeah. such regulations you can only you'll never find you can yeah. only do that and that first. Yeah. Do they oh. do they change the regulations eventually to match the practice? There are no regulations against studying that way. I see. Okay. <laughs> we have made them up. Thank yeah. you. We made them up. Right. <laughs> and sent them to the 16th century. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Michael Stolberg, please. Um, I have a brief comment more on, on the question of, of medical manuscripts, student notes. Um, apart from this marvelous collection in Gotha, there's a pretty good collection in Erlangen, and there's a collection of about 3,000 pages by just one student in Vienna. But what is really striking is that most of these manuscripts are not from German universities. They really come from students who studied in Italy. And two aspects maybe might be interesting for the general topic here. One is quite a few of these lectures are private lectures. So you will not even find them at all in any curriculum, on any list of prescribed topics or texts, but they really are on specific topics, not on specific authors. And the second special aspect possibly from medicine is that medicine is very much geared to practical training. So you've got lots of notes which are not in lectures, but they're actually on anatomy demonstrations there are in botanical uh, demonstrations or going to a botanical garden. And most of all, they are lect uh, notes simply on what the professor said at the bedside in a hospital or in, the, in patients' private homes already in the 16th century. Yeah, thank you very much for, for clarifying that. Um, um, from the collection in Mattenberg, there are just um, two from Germany, two in Jena. That, are, um, that exist in this collection. One was during the time when he was actually in Jena and the other one is 10 years, the lecture was held 10 years before he was there. So apparently there was a, uh, also a, a transcription of this lecture that was circulating and that was available to him in Jena and he, he copied that down uh, at the time. But otherwise all of them are from, from Padua, as well as several thousand pages uh, or 2000 maybe, yeah.